Okay, today is October 23rd, 2012. We are in Learning Unit 4, Memory and Suggestibility. Next week is the final examination. I want to remind you to make sure that the, the midterm examination, thank you for correcting me. I make a mistake again, feel free to correct me. You'll understand that joke later on, but the midterm examination is a week from tonight. Make sure that you're able to log in where you sit, because next week you must log in from your seats here in this classroom to take the midterm examination. So we are beginning memory and suggestibility, and what we talk about today will be on the midterm examination, okay? We're going to evaluate you on your mastery of the first four learning units. So whatever's in here, including what I don't talk about, may be on the midterm examination. I'm going to go over the chapter that is posted there called Memory and Suggestibility. That's a chapter from a book by Wendy Borg. And I'm going to go over the printable PowerPoint this evening. So we're going to start with the Borg chapter, chapter 15, which is a PDF. And at the beginning of her chapter, uh, Professor Borg talks about something called trace strength. You see it on the big board, trace strength. And she gives a definition of it. She explains that it's often used to describe the accuracy of the acquisition process. And this process of acquiring a recollection or a memory is what she's focusing on. And she says that it's possible to acquire a memory only for aspects of an event that were the focus of attention. And I think I made this observation a few weeks back and may have repeated it about sometimes children might focus on one aspect of their experience that's salient or relevant to them. And sometimes what is important to them, or what they focus on, isn't the same kind of thing we grown-ups might focus on. I think I gave the example of crazy Argyle socks when we would want to know, you know what his face looked like, and whether he had facial hair, and those kinds of things. This is what she addresses here. Children may attend to different aspects of an event than adults the color of a person's socks and shoes versus the color of hairs and eyes. Children are less attentive also to time, and we talked at length about time, than adults. So acquisition, acquisition of memory refers to experiences taken in and sent to memory centers for storage. Let's focus on that for a second. What are we talking about when we talk about suggestibility? Well, in order to really appreciate suggestibility, we have to think about memory and how it works. And this is its most basic level. Okay? Its most basic level. When we take in information based upon an experience that we have, whether it be running up the stairs to turn off the tea kettle or witnessing a car crash, whatever it is, when we experience that and take it in, it's called encoding. Encoding. Okay? That's part of memory acquisition, encoding. And when it gets encoded and processed and it's in our recollection, we may be asked to call upon that memory later. That's called retrieval, when we retrieve our memories. And that happens anytime someone asks us to describe a past event we are called upon to retrieve the memory. Now, there's actually three parts to this process. Let me refresh my memory using a cue, which is the chapter. Does someone in the class know and can tell me? Encoding, what's the other part? Thank you. Encoding, storage, and retrieval. That's the middle part. So when you run up the stairs to turn off the tea kettle, you're encoding that event. And once it's encoded, you have to put it somewhere. And we store it, much like a computer hard drive, right? We store it in our memory, and we're asked to reflect upon that event later and recall it for somebody. We call that retrieval. 
Now, suggestibility. Well, suggestibility is a disruption in that process. Suggestibility is a disruption in that process of memory acquisition. A disruption in encoding or storage or retrieval. At any point in that process, it can be disrupted through suggestibility. Now, suggestibility can be imparted to a child. A child may be vulnerable to suggestion either by pre-event information or post-event information. Or sometimes information that is offered to the child as it's happening. So you'll see, and I'll talk about some experiments that were done that examine the impact of suggestibility in terms of pre-event suggestibility. And that's a study called the Sam Stone study. There are many studies. One of the more impactful and memorable studies among child advocates is the Sam Stone study. And in that case, the kids are told lots of stuff about a man named Sam Stone. And they're told about it before they ever meet Sam Stone. And then they're questioned about what Sam Stone did in front of the classroom. And their recollections were uneven at best. Some of them were completely erroneous about what Sam Stone did. And that lesson focuses on pre-event suggestibility in the form of something called stereotyping. Stereotyping. And I'll, I'll hone in more on this. Okay? But at Sam Stone, we consider pre-event because, because before he ever came into the classroom, the teacher told the little children that Sam Stone was clumsy, that he was an oaf, that he knocked things around and down all the time, that he was an awkward, goofy guy. And when he came to the classroom, and these were preschoolers, they always pick on the preschoolers because they are the most vulnerable to suggestion and the most easily manipulated and distorted when it comes to their recollections. Anyway, they told the preschoolers, some may have been as old as six, that Sam Stone was a clumsy guy. Well, when he came, he didn't do anything clumsy. He didn't do anything at all. He just came to the classroom, he smiled, said hello, and he left. And then the children were questioned about certain things that were presented to them, a book, a teddy bear, which we'll learn more about later. The point here, though, is this is, this is pre-event suggestibility. All right? Post-event suggestibility can happen after somebody experiences something. So if you ran up the stairs to shut off the tea kettle, or you witnessed a terrible car crash, or you were asked about the time that you fell off the deck of the yard and fractured your ankle. If you're asked about that, or if you're presented with stimuli or information that has the capacity to distort that recollection after it happens, after the event, that would be post-event suggestibility or post-event information. So people's memories can be distorted by stuff they learn before they experience an event, by stuff they learn after they experience an event, and sometimes by stuff that's happening as they experience an event. And I'll give you an example of child maltreatment. You know, sometimes when men, uh, typically men, when a man is molesting a child, he may characterize what he's doing during the molest. And it is not accurate, it is not factual, but it is offered to the child during the molestation itself to redefine what that child experiences. And it's a form of suggestion. And in this case, the suggestibility doesn't have a negative impact for the defendant or the accused. Rather, the opposite. Uh, it has a positive impact for him because it redefines things in a way that makes it appear that he's innocent. Give me an example of what I'm talking about. You can think of something. What might some nefarious minded molester say while he's molesting a child that redefines her experience as an example of uh, concurrent event suggestibility? That is, it's happening as the event occurs. The suggestion. He loves the child, the daughter. This is the way he shows his love. 
Yeah, that would be an example, not the most concrete example I was thinking of, but yeah, he's, he's characterizing his emotions and his motivations. I'm talking more about what the child's experiencing, but you're correct. When he's saying those kinds of, some might even be true, statements, he might love the child, and this may be his own bizarre, distorted way of showing affection, but you know, he's giving her information during the molest. That's, that's an example of it. What's a more a concrete example? Maybe by saying, like, this is, this is, everybody does this, this is normal, everybody does it, nobody talks about it. Yes, that would be normalizing it during the molest. It would be characterizing how you should feel about it. It's closer to what Olaf's thinking about and a little bit different from what I'm thinking about. But again, that's a good example of a guy giving information during the molest. That's erroneous, misleading, and deceptive, yeah. It might hurt a little. No, I'm talking about something more concrete. You know, these guys are very devious. What might they say? Like what? Yes, like what? This is how we play house. Yeah, it will be more more specific. Well, you're, you're right. You've got my answer. You don't have a good example of it, but you're right. Would they redefine or say something completely different? So, like, this is like when you suck a long off. Yeah, but I get a kid. Let me give you an example. Yes, but I think most children would realize that that's not what's happening. But I'm going to check you to see if you have any diseases. Like the doctor does. I need to do this to make sure you're okay. I need to do this so you can be with boys when you're older. I need to um, give you a rub down or a back rub because you're um, playing softball for so long. We need to give you a back rub or whatever. Well, they need to find exactly what's happening and suggest that they're wrestling, that they're putting medicine on, that they're giving a back massage. Or sometimes they might call it something completely different. Again, if you're dealing with real little kids, preschoolers, you can throw in something bizarre and improbable just to screw up the child's recollection, just to, to avoid detection. We're going to go apple picking now. Show me your apple. Uh, they may use words that connect and resonate with the children but are designed to distort, right? So when the child's interviewed, they talk about going apple picking with that. That's why we need to, I mentioned it last week, I said check for definition. Remember at the end of class, I used some crude slang terms for oral sex and sexual acts that a child might repeat, and I said, check for definition. I don't know what they mean by going down or giving head. You need to see what they mean. Even something innocuous. I never went apple picking before. What do you do when you go apple picking? What did Dad do when he went apple picking? So sometimes they might recharacterize that experience in a way that's real close to what's happening, especially with ambiguous events. One of the most ambiguous of all parent-child interactions, which is the most difficult to investigate and prosecute unless you build a good case and do a good forensic interview, happens in a, in a particular room in the house. Go ahead. Shower. Where else? The little ones are usually in the bathtub, right? Bath time. Bath time. And that's where I'm giving you a bath where nobody was getting a bath. The child was being molested. In, in, in whatever case it is, these are things that present themselves throughout this course in different ways. The reason I'm bringing up at this moment is those kind of statements about the bath or massage or I love you or we're playing house or where you know you shouldn't tell anybody this, those kinds of things. That's stuff that is interfering with recollection as it happens. So you got pre-event, post-event, and sometimes during the event, suggestibility. Now Suggestibility can arise not only from words and questions, although that's the primary danger in forensic interviewing, that we might ask a question that's suggestible, but it can arise from how we behave in the interview room, uh, the way we express ourselves, the tone that we use, excuse me, statements that we make um, at any time during our interaction with children. So it's not only words, although words and sentences and Language can be influential on, child's, on children's memories. Um, 
suggestibility can arise in a variety of different ways, and we'll look more closely at it um, now. So having described what the issue is, we'll get back down into the chapter on suggestibility. Here's what Bohr calls suggestibility. The likelihood of changing the memories themselves or a person's report of the memories by exposing that person to biasing influences, such as leading questions, inaccurate information, or a coercive interviewer. And it's even more than that. Um, and we'll look at some of the ways over the next hour, hour and a half. Again, referring simply to children's memories for a minute and taking a step back from suggestibility, we need to be mindful that memory storage improves as, chi as children get older. So we said there's encoding, there's storage and retrieval. Uh, we all have similar abilities during the encoding phase. How much of it gets stored and how long it's stored varies depending upon how old someone is and children's abilities to store recollections of events improves with age. It's the smaller children that give us a problem sometimes. Now storage problems are referred to as trace decay. Trace decay. Okay. Trace strength is the accuracy of the acquisition process. Going back a little bit Trace strength describes how good somebody remembers something. And as time goes on, you're confronted with trace decay. And to put that simply, it's called forgetting. Okay, That's trace decay, when you forget stuff. Children forget more quickly than adults, and the younger the child, the more quickly the forgetting. Now, here's an interesting aspect of memory. And this is important for child maltreatment investigations. It has been hypothesized that there are two kinds of memory systems at work when we experience something. One is based upon sensory impressions, emotions, faces, and it probably develops in infancy. <coughs> And I think I mentioned that Professor Heath has a video clip in one of her courses where a mother is sitting with an infant. The infant's three or four months old at best. And the baby's laughing and the mother's interacting and poking and goofing around with the little child. And then the mother just adopts a flat demeanor. She doesn't smile. She doesn't frown. She just remains blank. And I'd say within 30 to 40 seconds, the baby begins sobbing. And I'm reminded of that when I look at Borg's statement that the sensory memory that's been hypothesized about is based upon sensory impressions, emotions, and faces, and probably develops in infancy. So the upshot of this section, section four in Borg's chapter, is that we theorize that there's two ways that people remember stuff. We remember it through our emotions, through our senses. There's that kind of memory that's reliant on our sensory recollections of the event. And then there's verbal memory. Verbal memory, the more common memory, the one we think of, where we put into words, where we process running up the stairs to shut off the tea kettle with words in our mind. So you have a sensory member, a sensory memory, and a verbal memory. The sensory memory is that memory that remembers the sounds, the smells, the, the emotions of what happened the images. And then you have verbal memory, the more common memory. It's verbally mediated and develops throughout the lifespan. 
Now, if memory is stored non-verbally, Borg writes, it's going to be difficult to get a report. Because questions, verbal cues, may not call up the memory. And if the memories elicit it, the kids may have a tough time using words to describe what they recall. As I've said more than once, and I'll say it again, children, especially preschoolers, know more than they can tell. There's no real problem with the memory. It's commanding the words and the narrative so the, chi the children can tell us what happened. That's the hard part. They may have difficulty using words to describe what they recall. However, kids may re-experience the event on a non-verbal level, feeling the way they did when it happened, seeing what happened. Now, this is controversial. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Not everyone agrees with this. There's not a lot of data to support this. However, on an intuitive level, on an intuitive level, it kind of makes sense. And I'm sure we've all had experiences in our lives that when we recall when we recall that experience, we may be able to also recall how we felt, or what the air was like that day, if it was something that connected with us. And in some ways, those things can be cues as well. Later on, in a little bit, I'm going to talk about different kinds of cues to memory. But I, I remember, and I, this is, I guess, a, a smack, a smidgen of traumatic memory, but I remember playing football in high school and, and in, in junior high school and detesting the double and triple sessions. These were uh, three times the practice you had to do, or two times the practice, and they were rigorous. And I, I remember when they started, it was the end of the summer, and I, uh, the smell of fresh cut grass may give you a pleasant sensation. To me, it is, reminds me of uh, terrible football practice sessions that I just would didn't want to do it. I wanted to do everything in my power to get out of. Um, but what's important here is I'm not only remembering the guy, the coach, the jumping over the barrel, jumping over the obstacles and wind sprints and dropping to the ground and jumping back up very quickly, all that kind of stuff. That's that verbal memory. I remember that. But I, all, I also remember what the air felt like that day. I remember how the fresh cut grass uh, felt and smelled as you were hitting the dirt. And well, that's what Borg is talking about here. And I say, you know what, on an intuitive level, it feels right. And it matters because when we're talking to kids and we're asking them questions about an abusive experience, sometimes we may use props. And some of those props include using anatomical dolls. And one of the major assumptions of the utility of anatomical dolls, one of the major thoughts about why anatomical dolls are good is that it, it is a prop. It is a very tangible, concrete thing that the child can look at that takes them back to time and place, that taps into not that verbal memory, but that sensory memory. So when they're interacting with the dolls and showing you what happened, the showing aspect of it, the moving the dolls, maybe from the first floor to the second floor, because that's where Grandpa took me from the first floor to the second floor. That act of re-experiencing and reenacting can shape the recollection and give you more information, better information, <coughs> and different information. Different information. So, Borg points out to the theorists who suggest that memory is remembered not only through words, but also sensations. Sensory memory versus verbal memory. Everybody got that? Any comments? So don't judge me, but I was watching uh, the Kardashian Twitter that show was the other day. You were simply channel surfing. <laughs> Office and they were like talking about what happened in their lives or whatever. And like 
Chloe was all like saying like this is what happened when our dad died and Kim was like no that's totally not how it happened and they were going back and forth. So then later on in the episode, does anybody see this? Okay, everybody saw it. See, so like it's not just me. So later in the episode, I think it was Kim or somebody said to Chloe like I think it's because so that like they're trying to resolve not what's going on. Kim says like I think it's just because you were so young. Like all the things you heard us all talking about, I think that you sometimes remember that you recall that as being your own memories, but you weren't actually there or part of it. It's just that, like, so that. And I was like, wow, what a sophisticated way of like talking through your differences for the Kardashians. I was so impressed, right? Because she was saying like you were the youngest one, and you think you were there, and you think that this is what happened, but really you just heard us talking about it, and you weren't actually over there. I thought it was really interesting. Well. What would you call that? No, listen. She made an observation that's relevant. You're reporting it to me. I, I don't have to like the show to say that was a good observation. Yes, it was a good observation. What would that observation be? That's similar to my... Well, in part, in part, that goes back to the perspective about my key story. Well, we call that source misattribution. Source misattribution. And Kim Kardashian, although it pains me to say, is dead on. I may bring her in as a guest lecturer. I, I will I don't know if it was find her, her a, 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 a nearby community hotel. Well, that may be true, too. A lot of that stuff is scripted. I thought it was a Caught me and I was like, whoa, that's like, it's yeah. interesting that they went there because that's a very, very now, let's focus on the academic aspect. <laughs> right. That, I mean, the reason why it's source misattribution, mm -hmm. and uh, we're jumping ahead a little bit here, but it's, it's, it's good enough time as any to talk about what we mean by that. This is source misattribution is an example of pre event suggestibility in this sense. Um, or is it post-event? Let me think about that. They already experienced the event, and the girl thinks she was there, right? Yeah, I think so. I don't know exactly what they were talking about, but I think that was just... Well, whatever it is, when you have a recollection, and you, and you report what you experienced, the question sometimes is, is that recollection historically accurate? Is it real? Is it factual? because you experienced it? Or is that recollection being reported, not fabricated, because it's very real to the person who's saying it? Or is that recollection a product of suggestibility, a product of something that you think you experienced? See, that's where it gets a little problematic in forensics, because the person who says it really believes it, OK? And in many cases of suggestibility, the person who says it thinks they experienced it, but their memory is distorted or corrupted or influenced by something or someone or, or some questions. But sometimes children hear things so often that they have a very concrete memory as if it did happen, and they can report it persuasively and credibly. You want to believe that? They're like, yeah, blah, 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 blah. This is the way it went down when in fact they never experienced it at all. Whenever somebody reports something that's a product of suggestibility, okay, in some way, shape, or form, but is erroneous or wrong, that's source misattribution. When the child says something happened to them, but not because they experienced it, but because they heard it, or they saw it on TV, or they were presented with that stimuli in some other way, but they reported as if it happened to them, that's source misattribution. And uh, my ex-mother-in-law gave me a good example the other day, and I'll talk about the perspectives example in a minute, but, and this has to do with script memory too. And we didn't get to this, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but script memory is the kind of memory that people have when they do things repetitively, like locking the, the door when you leave the house, or 
refreshing your pet's water or brushing your teeth or taking a shower every morning. Something that you do repetitively is encoded and stored. But you, when you recall it, because every event is so similar to every other event, you really have a tough time figuring out which event was which, or, or separating one shower from another shower. And that happens with molested kids, or even kids who are physically battered if it happens repetitively. Excuse me. So script memory describes the memory that forms surrounding repetitive experiences that are very similar. And when we as kids what happened when dad rubbed your uh, privates, and if that happened between ages 8 and 11, they're really not telling us about any specific time. What they're usually capable of telling us is how it usually happens how I usually take a shower, how I usually brush my teeth, how I usually put the water out for the pets. You see? So script memory, script memory is that memory that is acquired when you experience repetitive acts. And you'll see that later. And that's why we have to be careful with kids. We need to if they say it happened over and over again the same way, we need to say something to them like, and this is what we recommend and what we teach. Well, was there a time that was different? Or tell me about a time you remember best. Or tell me about a time that happened in a different place. Or tell me about the last time or the first time. And the way we express that to children is we'll say, listen, Daniela, you know, you told me that dad would touch your privates with his hand all the time. And it started when you went to second grade and it lasted until the fourth grade. Now you know you're dealing with script memory, right? Because it's touched with the hand on the privates. It's very similar. It's repetitive. And, you know, I talk to lots of kids. And some kids like to tell me about, about this kind of thing. Some kids like to tell me about the first time it happened. Some kids like to tell me about the last time. Or maybe a time they remember best. Why don't you tell me about one time that you want to talk about? And you don't even have to say, I talk to lots of kids. That's perfectly OK. You can simply say, Danielle, you told me that dad touches you with his hand on your privates, and it started in the second grade all the way up to the fourth grade. I want, to, I want you to tell me about one time that you remember. Maybe the first time, maybe the last time, or, or, or maybe a time you remember best. And they'll, I leave it up to them. You leave it up to them, and they'll do their best. And then you stay on that time. We talked about the chapter headings and language last week, right? Stay on that time. Stay on that time. And then you might say, I want to talk about another time. And you know, was there a time that it was different? Was there a time it happened in another room, a different place, things like that? So that's how you tease out discrete incidents from script memory. Okay. Did I give the example of the waitress last week? I don't know where I was, who I was talking to. Maybe. This isn't an exact example of script memory, but we've all been to restaurants many times. And the process is very similar. You come up, you want your beverage, you're going to take your order. It's very mechanical, it's very scripted. Not exactly the same as when you brush your teeth, or you take a shower, or you let the dog out. That stuff is mechanical and repetitive, and it's personal to you. But even going to a restaurant and being serviced by a waitress or a waiter, it's very mechanical, very routine, very, very similar. And often, uh, when you have uh, someone you're sharing a meal with say, listen, I, they didn't give me enough butter, which one's our waitress, right? Or waiter. You ever been, you ever experienced that? Which one's our waiter? 
and they've been to your table five times already? <laughs> well, because it's very routine, and also because of your lack of attentiveness, that's another factor in this kind of situation. You don't remember too well. But if something was different about this time, you know, I went to, uh, and I know many of you probably have been to one of these places many years ago. They became the rage about 10 years ago, eight years ago, these Brazilian barbecues. That was different. That process was different. So that was different from the mechanics of the typical restaurant. So I might remember it a little bit better the guy. But imagine if that guy dropped hot soup in your lap. Right? That waiter you're going to remember, right? So when it's different, especially if it's memorable, if something distinct happens, you know, that can take what is typically a script recollection kind of experience and turn it into something more memorable. So getting back to my ex-mother-in-law, she says, she says, she's by the house um, watching my son, and, and, and she says, no, I say, you left your charger for the phone. And it's a Samsung charger, and her phone's a Samsung. <coughs> um, she said, I didn't leave it there. I took it home. And I said, I don't know. It's in your room by your nightstand. It's, it's the same make as your phone. And that's not, you know, I've never had a Samsung object in my house ever. I, I'm not sure. She goes, I distinctly remember... When I went home, taking the charger and putting it in the drawer like I always do. And I said, do you remember? Or is that script memory? What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> but think about it. We all have routines about things. And, you know, with these gadgets we have to have now, you got to go put it in. You can do whatever you do to end the day with your gadget, perhaps. But... You know, she remembers every day what she does with her phone, puts the, I don't know why she puts it in the drawer, I mean, the phone and the charger goes in the drawer or whatever, but it's very, very much a routine of hers, and, and while it may have felt like she remembered about that particular day, because that day is routine, personal to her, and unvarying, uh, I suggested to her that it might simply be her script memory recollection. Now, getting back to Kim Kardashian. <laughs> Her recollection of putting the charger into the drawer was not a true recollection. Actually, it turned out it wasn't her charger. She was 100% right, but what do I know? But if, 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 she, if she was wrong... Her recollection to tell me that she put the charger away would have been an example of source misattribution. She thinks she remembers that weekend putting the charger away, when in fact it was her scripted memory, a prior recollection, that was the source of this recollection. Now, I think my personal example is a better example than this one, because it gets a little complicated because of the script memory. Oh, my it's in my perspective section, I talked about, and I think, Golan, you started calling Joey with the key or something. I posted something somewhere, didn't you? Okay. But when I was a Joey, my, my mother used to tell me this story about how when I was a preschooler, I took her set of keys and I stuck the key in the electrical socket and the charge from that event, from sticking the key in there was so powerful, that it slightly melted the key, and I screamed, and I recoiled, and I dropped the key, and she pulled it out, the key was warm and melted. And I was a priest, I was a little kid, I, she told that story so often to so many people, that I used to tell the story as if I remembered it. I would tell people, one time when I was a little kid, I stuck the key in the socket, and it melted, it burned, and whatever, I recoiled, I fell down. But as I reflect upon that, and as someone who studies memory now and suggestibility and children and language and all this stuff, I don't remember that. I only remember it because my mother said it so often that it's become part of a recollection, but it is not a recollection based upon the source of having experienced it. The source of that memory is my mom saying it. 
But if I reported it as if I remember it happening, that would be an example of source misattribution. I'm attributing the source of it from living it when I'm wrong. The source of that recollection is having heard it. So when I report it, though, when a kid reports something that happened to them, not because they experienced it, but because they heard it or it was suggested to them, when they get it wrong but think they got it right, that's called source misattribution. And the general concept is called source attribution. Source, when you read among your reading, source attribution continues to be a problem with preschool children. That's true. And what they mean by that is preschoolers have a hard time figuring out, did that really happen to me or did somebody tell me it happened? Did my mommy tell me it happened? And, and, and did I really live it, that experience? And it is. Source attribution is a problem with preschoolers and older kids. And it is an issue that arises in the area of forensic interviewing and suggestibility of children. And when kids get it wrong, or anybody gets it wrong, we call that source misattribution. And Kim Kardashian made a very profound and academic uh, observation about source misattribution with her lovely she sister, Chloe. 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 Chloe was the little, 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 Chloe and Lamar Oda. He went to um, Rhode Island, played his ball there, and he went to the Lakers, he went to the Dallas Mavericks, now he's on the Clippers. You're correct. He was on the Lakers, Mavericks, now he's on the Clippers. He was in Vegas at the pool when I was there this summer. At the Mandalay Bay. Because the Clippers were training there. But I didn't see any Chloe's or Kimmy's or anybody. <laughs> Now, the other kind of memory you have up to date info on Lamar. He quit the Clippers. The Clippers? I he was out. Uh, I don't know. They're a good team. I wouldn't leave them. Recognition versus recall memory. This is another way that we conceptualize memory, okay? And this is real important when we talk about forensic interviewing with children. Recall memory, recall memory, is that memory that we can offer without any cues or prompts from the questioner. Example. Tell me what happened today at school. That, that is a request for recall memory. We're not focusing you on any one particular aspect of school. It requires that you think about what happened and provide a narrative. My son today went, I'm so proud of him, he went to the quiz bowl. And I don't know that if he's gifted and talented, but that's who's running this thing. And he went to the quiz bowl today. He wore a shirt and a collar black jeans. And when I called him to check up on him, I said, how was the quiz bowl? Tell me everything about the quiz bowl. That would be a question asking for free recall, recall memory. I didn't want to know who won, how many points. I wanted to know all that, but not from that question. When I simply said, tell me about the quiz bowl, that is a question that requires free recall. He needs to recall everything that happened and give me a narrative about what happened. Now, recognition memory would be when I asked him a question that had specific information in it that jogged his memory. You said you won. What was the final score? Oh, they had 12 points and we had 4 points. Okay, it doesn't give them the answer. It's not leading. But it gives them information to cue them. So, recognition memory is memory that we that a person provides based upon cues or prompts. Recognition memory. The root of the word is recognition. So you recognize something and it helps you remember it. Free recall 
is the most accurate form of memory. Memory that's prompted through the use of cues or other prompts is less accurate. And that doesn't mean that it's not accurate. I'm going to give an example that's made up just to demonstrate this point. Imagine that free recall is 88% accurate. And information that children provide through recognition memories, 79% accurate. Free recall is more accurate than recognition memory. But recognition memory is pretty damn good memory too. But there is a degradation in accuracy, there's no doubt about it. Now, I don't know what the real numbers are, but that's the fact. Kids can provide quality information through recognition memory, but it's never as good as free recall memory. And you'll see when we talk more specifically about forensic interviewing of children that these two types of memories and what they mean is very important because we teach in all forensic interview protocols to be open-ended as much as possible, to ask questions that call for recall memory. You want to avoid questions that call for recognition memory. But aha, here is the forensic interviewer's dilemma in child maltreatment. When I asked Daniel to tell me everything about the quiz ball, you know what he said? It was okay, we won. What else? That's it. That was, those two statements were both accurate, 100% accurate. But I didn't get a lot of information, did I? Free recall gives the most accurate information, but less information. Not a lot of it. Especially with kids. But with all persons, children and grown-ups. But it's, the differences are more pronounced with children. So free recall memory, you get a little bit of memory. It's really high quality memory, but you don't get a hell of a lot. Kids need guidance. They need cues. They need prompts. They need their recollection jar. It's a fact of child development. It's as simple as that. And the judicial system and the law ought not prejudice children simply because they don't have the developmental tools to express themselves in a courtroom. We ought to be able to use questions that have information but that are non-leading or minimally suggestive in order to tap into kids' recollections, especially about child maltreatment and molestation. We shouldn't close the courtroom doors because kids can't answer free recall questions. And we don't. The good news is we're allowed to ask questions that call for recognition memory. Now, recognition memory is not a product simply of questions, although that's the standard way we get info from kids. Bless you. I mentioned some prop before in discussing how this may play into the dichotomy of sensory memory and verbal memory. What prop do we use that would be very helpful in tapping into children's recognition memory? What kind of prop did I mention about 15 minutes ago? Anatomical dolls, right? Recognition memory can arise from experiencing similar circumstances, or a familiar smell, or something that just jogs the memory. A coffee cup can tap, tap into recognition memory. In fact, under our law, in all 50 states, you're allowed to refresh a witness's memory and although the courts didn't really realize this, I guess, in England when the rules of evidence were forming, but they said, you know what, if somebody doesn't remember something, you can jog their memory. You can show them a document. You can hold up an iPhone. You can show them a sneaker. You can bring in a leaf from the ground. As long as it's on a record in the court and everybody knows what the heck you're showing the witness, <coughs> doesn't have the answer to the question written on it, you can use anything in the whole wide world to refresh someone's recollection under the rules of evidence in New Jersey and all the other states. And that rule of evidence is really a, a tacit adoption of recognition memory standards in um, the New Jersey rules of evidence. It realizes that sometimes memory needs to be jarred or jogged. 
and we call that kind of memory recognition memory. And I always remember this because the word recognition is built in there. So if you recognize something, it helps you remember. Something that law enforcement does, I did it here. I prosecuted a case where four men raped a 15, 16-year-old girl that they met at Willowbrook Mall. And she was a runaway. Her father was, I found her father in Texas. Her mother was going to find And we lost her eventually. But she was working at the Willowbrook Mall uh, doing the surveys. Uh, she must have lied about her age. I think it was 15. She lied about her age. She was taking surveys, those folks that come up and try to walk the other way and they ask you questions. Anyway, a bunch of young men met her there and invited her to a party at Clove Road. Those apartments are called something else now. They're part of the dorm system at this university. Back then, they were student housing here. Anyway, they took her there and they... Um, I told you this story already? Uh, they, um, uh, they began to drink. Other girls came who were all over 20, 21, 22. The boys were 23 to 26. She was 15. They didn't know her. They picked her up in the mall. And they encouraged her to drink all kinds of alcohol. They went to the Great Notch on Route 46. Well, they have a package with us. <laughs> they have a little place they got. That's like the oh. scariest place. They have yeah, they have a Motorcycle guys. Where the popular joints. Foster movie starts. Nah. <laughs> I, I go there. My people go there. There's a motorcycle just go there and stuff. But not only that. But anyway, I didn't know they had package goods. I've never seen package goods in there. But they reported that they went in there and they got some. I'll tell you, the motorcycle guys ain't drinking this stuff. I never heard of stuff <laughs> in this case. Alizé. You drink Alizé? I don't know. Alizé, 151 rum, and some other stuff. I'm going to get a pint of another beer. It's some kind of the core or syrupy sweet thing of a Jake Alizé. Anyway, the girl drank the Alizé. She drank some beer. And then they... They encouraged her to chug the balance of a bottle of 151 proof of Cardi rum. And the bet was that she couldn't walk around the track over here, the track on the university. You know, and she did, and I'm sure they were cheering. I don't remember that part of the case. And um, the girls that were there were going to stop it, trying to get the bottle from her. She was 15, trying to, for whatever psychological reasons, was totally into it. Perhaps she thought she'd win a bet and have a few dollars in her pocket. In any event, she drank it. Four of the men took her to the track. The girls were screaming, you're a bunch of pigs. Don't go, don't go. They knew what was on the men's minds. She made it about a third of the way uh, by the radio tower here. There's a radio tower. I don't know where I'm standing. But there's a radio tower here that the Montclair State University radio signal uh, is transmitted from. And there's a path that leads from that radio tower towards the track. And she got about a third of the way down. Uh, on this dirt path with the four men as they were heading to complete this bet, and boom, she hit the dirt. She began to bleed and vomit as she lay there in the blood and vomit. They took off her clothes and had sex with her lifeless body, and we indicted all four of them for sex sexual assault. And when I tried the case, one of the first things I did was ask the witnesses. The victim was long gone, by the way. She had run away again. She was a runaway. I tried the case without a victim. Uh, But I had co-defendants, so I was able to do that. And I had some photos of her, and we flew her father in from Texas. And I had her little size zero pants. They were mud jeans. I remember them well. And uh, the jury got to look at those. I felt they were very tangible. Piece of evidence they could take in the room and get a sense of who this girl was. In any event, I brought the other women. I indicted them, too, because they lied at the hospital and made misrepresentations. So they were, they were indicted as well as the men. But they didn't do anything to the girl. They covered it up and lied to the police and did things like that. And eventually uh, we turned them, and one of the boys who molested her, I had to make a deal with him. They weren't boys, they were men. One of the men who molested her, I had to make a deal with him. It was another guy who didn't do anything, but was at the scene. So I had those two who saw the beginning, one guy was involved, and the two girls. I took them to the scene. I had them walk up and down where we were. They pointed to where she fell, where they found the body, how they dragged her from the middle of the um, dirt path up to the top, where the ambulance pulled up, how they carted her into the car. And i tell you something. If I didn't take the young women there, who were my primary witnesses, 
Uh, I wouldn't have got that much information from them. It is critical, and uh, one of my earliest judges that I worked for when I first joined the prosecutor's office uh, hammered this into me. Uh, always visit the scene of the crime. Always visit where it happened. Always, always, always. He goes, you want to be a great prosecutor or you want to be a good prosecutor? If you want to be a great prosecutor, you have to do these other things. And always, always go to the scene of the crime. And he's right. Because you never know what you're going to pick up there. That's different. That's from a lawyer perspective. But when you take the witnesses there, um, in part, the recognition of the sights, the sounds, and the smells taps into that recognition memory. And you get more information. It's as simple as that. You get more information. Okay? And more information is good. Any questions about these two forms of memory? Observations? What? Yeah. They were convicted. They were convicted of statutory sexual assault. Uh, they didn't agree with my theory that she was incapable of providing consent, that she was um, sexually assaulted while unconscious. Um, and not that they didn't agree with it, they felt there wasn't enough evidence, I assume. But they all were convicted because of the age disparity. She was 15, they were much older. Um, so they all agreed that sex happened, um, but the primary element of, element of my prosecution was that she was incapable of giving consent. That they, was, they were acquitted on. And I think in part, I remember telling the other prosecutors that I, I think the jury looked at it this way. When she went into the party, air quotes for the record, when she went to the party, she was highly sexual. Uh, she was all over the guys, kissing them, fondling them, dirty dancing. And, um, you know, the question is whether she agreed to this. I mean, in the end of the day, whether she agreed to that. Now, even if she, look, there's 50 reasons that I argued, and 50 reasons why whatever happened inside doesn't matter outside. But again, jurors' role isn't to prove what happened, but to see whether there's beyond a reasonable doubt but there's evidence beyond a reasonable doubt about what her state of mind was at the time there was sexual contact. And I guess they felt more comfortable with the statutory and they didn't feel 100% persuaded that she didn't consent out in the, you know, she might have been partially awake. I don't know how they theorized it, but at the end of the day, not guilty on that stuff. And I remember saying, I guess consent was in the air that day. I was lingering, but followed her around as she went down there. You know? But oops, many people look at sexuality that way. Well, you know, especially in these frat house or college party cases where, you know, people are doing stuff in the main room and then they go in the bedroom. It's like, well, you know, all that was happening downstairs. She must have consented. Which is preposterous. And, but, you know, jurors, jurors have a tough burden beyond a reasonable doubt. So I'll leave it at that. Scripted events can be recorded very accurately. I talked about scripted events already and scripted knowledge. I don't need to go back over that. This makes sense, but research teaches us that as memory fades, trace decay. We learned that earlier. Trace decay. Forgetting. As people forget stuff, they're more suggestible to questions. And they're more vulnerable to suggestibility. And more vulnerable to source misattribution. Because when the details fade, the questioner sometimes can fill in the blanks, and that's not good. Because memory fades and similar experiences may blend together. Children do forget faster and therefore are more susceptible to suggestibility than adults. We do know that when incorrect information is given to kids immediately after an event, while their memory is still strong, or what we call trace strength, 
they're much less likely to go along with the suggestion. Problem is, they forget really fast. And once they begin forgetting, they're very vulnerable to having the blanks filled in by suggestive questions or suggestive events. These are some examples of language. I talked a lot about language last week, but language is important always. Communication is impaired if a child fails to understand the question, the child can't make a reply because they don't understand the question or have some other disability, the interviewer doesn't understand the child's reply. Many times children may have memory of an event, but the interviewer's prompts are not an adequate cue. The interviewer wasn't able to tap into that memory. They didn't use the appropriate recognition cue. Sometimes the child simply lacks the skills to communicate. They might be developmentally disabled or just too little. All right, when we talked about uh, my key in the socket and Kardashian a moment ago, we talked about source attribution. The general way to talk about all this is called source monitoring. Uh, kids aren't very good at source monitoring when they're real little. Preschool children sometimes have difficulty remembering how they acquired information. The process of paying attention to where information is acquired from or how we acquire information is called source monitoring. Source monitoring. This section here is directed at, in part, directed at guided imagery. There was a trend some years ago where therapists were using guided imagery in therapeutic interviews. Even in the context of sexual abuse and incest. And we in forensics do not permit this at all. Um, we, this kind of stuff has no place in forensics. And I think now it really has no place in therapy either. But there was a time in the 80s, maybe the early 90s, where therapists were saying, well, imagine what it was like. Imagine what it was like when dad would come in your room. Think back and imagine for a moment what would happen when mom would go to work. And the latest thinking about this says that source monitoring difficulties are especially pronounced or they get worse if one imagines doing something, particularly if this imaginative process occurs repeatedly. And you're going to see a video clip in a little while about the mousetrap study. And in the mousetrap study, a bunch of children are mostly kids eight and under are interviewed over a period of many weeks, maybe 13 or 14 weeks, about different events. And they're also told to think real hard. Imagine getting your finger caught in a mousetrap. Think what it would be like if you got your finger caught in a mousetrap. They use this kind of guided imagery style in priming or biasing or being suggestible to kids. And some of the children, after many weeks, not only report things that never happened, but give some detail about what happened. And one, you'll see him in a little bit, he describes getting his finger caught in a mousetrap with great detail. And it never happened. So Wendy Borg, the woman who wrote the book and chapter 15 that we're examining now, is making the observation that source monitoring is a major issue when we use guided imagery or we tell somebody to imagine or think real hard. Um, 
and imagine stuff. And it's not a good strategy for interviewing kids. Now, with this caveat, Wendy Borg ends this section, and she's correct. She says, realizing that kids can report getting their finger caught in a mouse trap, and, and these kind of things can happen that are the product of suggestion, repeated suggestion, repeated misinformation, and this guided imagery. We recognize all that, but we have to always be mindful of the fact that unless children witnesses unless children witness an extended period of adult sexual activity are told in great detail how sexual activity occurs or participate directly in such activity they're unlikely to dream about sexual activity or to make reports of detailed sexual activity based upon what others have told them so although source monitoring is always in play and source misattribution is a problem With, especially with smaller children, it's unlikely that kids make up allegations of sexual abuse upon themselves. And it might happen sometimes, and when it does happen, it's more likely to happen with adolescents. But our challenge as forensic interviewers is to pull for details to find out as much as we can about it. Even if things were mistakenly suggested to them, the more details, the more information that a child gives us about the sights, the sounds, the smells of human sexuality, the peculiar body positioning, the peculiar things that humans say to one another, if kids can give us that information, well, that adds tremendous credibility to their victimization experience, even though some parts of the questioning might have been problematic. Borg recommends that you might want to ask, did you see so-and-so getting touched, or did someone tell you about it? What made you think it was a dream? Was there anything about it that seemed real? Now, I'm not going to tell you much more about the Sam Stone study because I'm going to show you the video. Where the Sam Stone study is. Referenced. And remember I said that this man named Sam Stone was scheduled to visit a preschool and a first grade. Again, we're dealing with three four-year-olds and then five and six-year-olds, so bear that in mind when you think about the Sam Stone study. But he didn't do anything when he came, but before he came, for a few weeks, the kids were told that he was a clumsy guy. Now, they call that stereotype induction. We're stereotyping Sam Stone as clumsy. That's pre-event suggestibility. So Sam Stone is all about stereotyping. So we'll look at that video in a minute. Now the way this happens in forensic interviewing might be what happened in the Margaret Kelly Michaels case. It may not be as blatant as Sam Stone, where they indoctrinate the kid, kids for a few weeks, but what sometimes happens is the interviewers will say things like they did in the Kelly Michaels case, we just want to make sure that Kelly doesn't hurt other kids and doesn't do bad things to other kids. So we need your help, buddy. It's okay, I know that you are having a tough time telling me what's happening, what happened, but if I know what happened, we can make sure Kelly goes to jail and doesn't hurt any other kids. 
When we demonize Kelly Michaels, when we say she's bad or she should be in prison, we're setting those children up. We're priming those children to make negative comments about Kelly Michaels. Now, what is Kelly Michaels? Well, Kelly Michaels is a case that involved a preschool teacher from Maplewood, New Jersey, and it was prosecuted by the Essex County Prosecutor in the late 1980s. The case had its beginnings rather in, an, in a rather non-dramatic fashion. A little boy was having his temperature taken anally and his mom was in the room with the pediatrician and the little boy said, Miss Kelly does that. And the mom questioned him further, Miss Kelly does that. And the mom's inference was that the insertion of the thermometer into the anus of the boy uh, was something that Miss Kelly was doing, something similar to that. So they wound up interviewing that boy and other children who made similar statements, and then they interviewed kids who never disclosed anything about Kelly. And at the end of the day, there was a hundred and, I think, thirty-nine count indictment. She was accused of molesting the children in a variety of ways. She was a preschool aide at the We Care Daycare in Maplewood. And I think she might have had her own class, too. Didn't they send letters, like, to all of the parents being like, here are some of the things that she's being accused of. Like, please talk to your children and see if they did any of these things. Like... Yes, they, they primed the parents to interview the kids. They also interviewed the kids in a very aggressive and coercive way. Um, they did a lot of things that we wouldn't do now um, in forensic interviewing. What really happened? What was the story? Well, well, we'll never know the truth, but she was accused of sexually assaulting them, of having the children have sexual relations with one another, perform acts of oral sex upon one another. Uh, took peanut butter from the school cupboard and wiped it on the children's penises and vaginas and she licked that off them and then the children would lick the peanut butter off of their body parts that she sang naked at the piano she made, they made her uh, they had to drink her urine right? yeah it got real weird real fast yet she was indicted and prosecuted and convicted and went to prison and the appellate division of the state of New Jersey reversed their convictions. The Essex County prosecutor appealed, and the Supreme Court of New Jersey affirmed the appellate division and created a type of hearing that became forever known as the Michaels hearing, otherwise known as a taint hearing, T-A-I-N-T. -T. And now prosecutors with preschoolers have to show that the child um, is not a victim of source misattribution, that their recollection is from having experienced it, not from having it suggested to them. In many cases involving preschoolers, you might have a Michaels hearing, which is the court's examination of the prosecutor's evidence surrounding the investigative interview. And the court wants to make sure that the children's recollection or child's recollection is a product of actual experience and not of suggestibility. So that is the legacy of Margaret Kelly Michaels. And that's referenced in this video as well. Now we're going to watch this video. And then we're going to end for the day. I, I want you to, before the exam, I want you to watch, and it's here, and you may have watched it already, my PowerPoint presentation. It's narrated just like I do in class here. Okay, let's make sure that the um, we got audio. Suggestibility in children. The overriding question is, can we, through our interviewing practice, get a child to say or believe something that is not true? What do you think? Now... I want you to watch that video. I'm not going to do that lecture. All I can do it, but you can watch that on your own time between now and the exam. And there's going to be questions from that video. But what I am going to do, which is reinforcing everything I just lectured on now, is to watch this video called Out of the Mouth of Babes. It's 93, 2000, it's 20 years old now. Woo! 
20 years old now, I remember running out and getting the VHS cassette to record this. I'm one of the few people in America who has a copy of this thing. And I've since made it digital. So, um... But let me show you some very important and startling videotapes. What you see could have a dramatic impact on the lives of thousands of people. Men and women are accused of child abuse on the word of young children. When children tell stories of being sexually abused by adults, should we believe them? There is now convincing scientific evidence that the answer is not necessarily. Now, there's no question about it. Some children will always tell the truth. And child abuse is a reality. But what researchers are proving is that some kids can be influenced to make up and then actually believe stories that never really happened. And tonight you'll see this with your own eyes. As John Stossel reports, the findings could change the outcome of sexual abuse cases which rest on a child's testimony. In Lowell, Massachusetts, Shirley Souza watches while her husband Ray tends his vegetable garden. Looks like a normal suburban scene, but the Souza's life is anything but normal. There's a half a dozen cute My phone's ringing. Several times a day, the phone rings because the State Department of Corrections wants each of them to face the camera attached to the phone. Shirley Souza, 285, Princeton Boulevard, Low Mass. The Souza's are prisoners in their home. They're under house arrest part of the 9 to 15 year sentence they received for molesting their two grandchildren. The first charges came in a letter from the district attorney. I came home from work and I, I walked in and the maintenance said, I wasn't going to show this to you, but um, you better look at it. And I, I couldn't believe it when, when I looked and I read it. I just... Can you imagine myself or any human being putting your head in a vagina, sticking toes in it? touching different places or putting a fist up the rails. It just wouldn't make it. Wouldn't it be some sort of serious damage? Wouldn't you notice right away? Every year, thousands of people like the Susans are convicted of child abuse. Even though there's no direct physical evidence, they're convicted simply on the word of four and five-year-old kids. Conventional wisdom is that kids that age wouldn't make such things up. They simply don't know enough about sexuality to come up with detailed accounts of sexual abuse. But then Cornell University professor Stephen Cece read the testimony of some well-known molestation cases and concluded that interviewers had led the kids on by asking suggestive questions. The interviewers could say, how else can we get this information out? Because the, the kids won't volunteer it. The problem is that from a research standpoint, we are now discovering that if you put kids who were not abused through the same kind of highly leading, repetitive interview, some of those children will also disclose events that seem credible, but in fact are not born in actuality. Now others have suspected this, but Cece decided to test that theory. He set up an experiment known as the Sam Stone study. He told a classroom full of four, five, and six-year-olds that a man named Sam Stone would come to their class and that he was very clumsy. Then the man came in, stayed a few minutes, and left. That's it. He didn't do anything clumsy. Then, four times in the next few months, half the kids were asked leading questions about the man's visit. Do you remember when Sam Stone came to the school and he broke that toy? Did he do it on purpose or was it an accident? Well, he didn't break a toy. So it's a highly suggestive, erroneously suggesting question. After that, another interviewer simply asked, I wasn't there that day, and I want to know everything that happened at the end of the day. Can you tell me what happened? This little boy said Sam Stone was reading a book during the visit to the classroom. He was doing it so fast that he read the one pages. Really? Did he say this girl said Sam Stone threw dolls and books in the air while he was in the class. Well, when the teacher saw that he was throwing things in the air, what did she say? Just asking leading questions inspired most of the kids to make stories up. In real life cases, though, are the investigators as suggestive as your testers are? What we do is a pale version of what happens in real cases. Uh, it doesn't come close, for example, to what was done in the Kelly Michaels case. 
The Essex County Prosecutor's Office says 26-year-old Margaret Kelly Michaels is a manipulative, sadistic child. Preschool teacher Michaels was convicted of molesting 19 children, molesting them in bizarre ways in the middle of this crowded New Jersey school without any teacher or parent noticing anything. She served five years in jail until this year when her conviction was overturned by an appeals court that questioned the reliability of the children's testimony. One day you're getting ready for work, making coffee, minding your business, trying to get along as best you can, being a reasonable, decent, honorable citizen, and the next minute you're an accused child molester with the most bizarre, I, I've never even heard of such thing even being done. They say you inserted objects including Lego blocks, forks, spoons, serrated knives into their anuses, vaginas, and a sword. Anuses, <laughs> and a sword. Yeah. Yeah. That you made children drink your urine, that you made kids take their clothes off and lick peanut butter off them. It's very hard to believe, yet jury believed it, and not you. No one was willing to doubt a child. And um, I think that's how the state won the case. They didn't have to present a credible case how it happened, or recreate the scene of the crime, or, or even presenting witnesses, but just they knew it was these little children saying, yes, Kelly was a bad person and she hurt me at this school, but no one would dare um, question that. She has a point. This past decade has seen a skyrocketing number of molestation claims, often against family members like the Sousas, and against daycare operators like McMartin in California and Little Rascals in North Carolina. All these cases are based primarily on the word of children who, after the fact, had repeatedly been asked questions like this. Do you remember that time when this asked you to stick his penis in your mouth? Okay. Um, None of the child abuse investigators would agree to be interviewed for this story. Some clearly go too far. They're pressing and beating against me, though. Yeah. Steve Cece's in the questioning of the Kelly Michaels case was just as leading as this. They say to the child, we want you to tell us what Kelly did. The kid says, I don't remember. Oh, yes, you do. You remember. No, I don't remember. You do so. We know you remember. At this point, the child's crying. I want to get out of here. You're not going anywhere if you tell us what we know you want, what we know you know. Basically, we're barraged with questions and coerced, manipulated, begged, made to feel guilty. Um, it just was disgusting. But where would the kids come up with saying things like, she put the knife in my vagina, or she covered me with peanut butter? Mm -hmm. The children have incredible imaginations. And it's not out of realm. Anybody who's a parent who's honest knows what the kid's capable of saying. Ray and Shirley were astonished when they heard their grandchildren's testimony. They said they'll reuse the machine as big as this whole house on them to violate them. We had a cage in the cellar that we locked them up. Never produced. Nothing. But why would kids make such things up? That's what convinces jurors. You hear those stories and you say, okay, maybe it's not all true. Maybe the machine wasn't as big as a house. Maybe Kelly Michaels didn't smear them all with peanut butter. Teachers would have smelled that. But there must be some truth to it. How could children come up with so many inventive, kinky activities and describe them with so many details unless something really happened? It's a persuasive argument until you hear about CeCe's next experiment. He and researchers asked four and five-year-olds to pick a card out of the deck of ten. On each card was a question. Okay, Derek. This one says, have you ever seen a baby alligator eating apples on an airplane? No. No? You ever had your finger caught in a mouse trap and had to go to the hospital? No. At first, almost all the kids say no. Mm -hmm. But then, once a week, for the next ten weeks, they ask the question again. No coercion, no leaning questions as in child abuse cases. They just gently repeat the question. You went to the hospital because your finger got caught in a mouse trap. Uh, uh, Did that happen? Uh-huh. Yeah? By week four or six or ten, most of the kids are saying, yes, it happened. And not just saying yes, but giving such precise information about it that you'd think it must have happened. Did it hurt? Yeah. Yeah? Who took you to the hospital? Mm, my daddy, my mommy, my brother. 
So where in your house is the mouse trap? It's, it's up at the down in the basement. Down in the basement. What is it next to in the basement? It's next to the firework. Anyway, what you see here is the child who's giving you a lot of perceptual detail. He's telling you where the mouse trap was. It, was. it was next to a wood pile in the basement. He had gone down there because he wanted to tell his dad, who was down there collecting firewood, that he's ready for lunch. He gets an argument with his brother Colin, which he, he later goes on to describe. They were fighting over some action figure. Colin pushes him next to the wood pile. He doesn't see where his hand's going, and it gets caught in the mouse trap. Were you surprised at the answers you got? I think it's fair to say that my colleagues and I were absolutely shocked that by the 10th week, not only were they assenting to some of these things that didn't occur, but they were giving very coherent narratives, highly elaborated narratives that are, I think, quite persuadable. By the time I met the same boy, it was weeks after the experiment, but he still could give lots of convincing details about things that never happened. Was there a time when, when you got your finger caught in a mouse trap and had to go to the hospital? Mm -hmm. uh, which, which finger was it? Remember, this is the result after a researcher simply asks the question once a week for 10 weeks. In real abuse cases, kids are questioned for years, often by parents, doctors, then by the investigator, perhaps a therapist, then by lawyers. Who went with you to the hospital? This boy's testimony is even more remarkable because just a few days earlier his father had discussed the experiment with him. He explained that it was just a test and the whole mousetrap event had never happened. The boy agreed it was just in his imagination. Still, listen to this. Let me ask you, did your father tell you something about the mousetrap finger story? Is it, is it true? Did it really happen? It really happened. It really happened? You really got your finger caught? It's really happened. Yeah. I assume the child isn't lying. They aren't intentionally making up stories. Absolutely. I think they've come to believe it. It is part of their belief system. Some experts believe they come closer to the truth using anatomically correct dolls. With dolls, they wouldn't have to ask so many questions. But Cece's colleague, Dr. Maggie Brook, conducted tests that led her to conclude using dolls also leads kids on. I would think anatomically correct dolls would be a good, neutral way to ask questions. I thought the, same, the very same way, but I'm, after having had this experience, I'm not quite sure how you do that. Brock and this pediatrician add some extra steps to his routine physical examination of preschool kids. He measures the child's wrists with a ribbon. He puts a little label on the child's stomach, and he tickles the child's foot with a stick. Never does the doctor go anywhere near the child's private parts. Then, right after the exam, using an anatomically correct doll, Brock asks leading questions about the doctor's exam. Can you show me how the doll, how the doctor never touched your vagina? He did. The child tells the truth. But just a few days later, Dr. Brock and the child's father again ask about the doctor's visit. It's a different story. Before Brock has a chance to even bring out the doll, the child shows how the doctor had strangled her with the ribbon. He put, he put that around your head. What the? And watch what happens when the doll is brought out. She's asked to explain what the doctor did that day. So what did he do? He put a stick in your vagina? Yeah. Just like that? It gets even more violent. She claims the doctor hammered the stick into her vagina. Then she shows that the doctor examined her. He was where? He did look in your body? Of course, none of it is true. Dr. Brook found that when dolls were used, half the kids who never had their private parts touched claimed the doctor had touched them. These tests make Dr. Brook question some of the recent testimony by children in court. Do you think there are dozens of people in jail now who are totally innocent? Yes, I do. The researchers' findings are only beginning to be heard in courtrooms. Most prosecutors still argue that children would lie. 
Prosecutors want to put Kelly Michaels back in jail. In a few months, they plan to retry her with the same charges. I will fight to the end because um, I am an innocent woman and I can look anyone in the eye and I have to fight for the rest of my life and I will do that. I will prepare for whatever will happen. You don't sound scared. No, I'm not scared. I'm angry. I'm outraged. I'm not scared. The Susans are planning an appeal of their own. Like Kelly Michaels, they believe a day will come when the courts and their grandchildren realize the truth. When those killers grow up, when they become adults, they're going to realize that things that never happen between Shelly and I and them. And I know that they're going to, they're going to realize that. If they're great children and they have a mind of their own. Nobody's prompting them when they grow up. They can remember and will embrace. John, you know, I'm, I remember I first worried about this sort of thing after some of the early cases that we reported. But children can be so convincing. How don't we separate out when they're telling the truth and when they're not? There is no good way. There, there are all kinds of experts who will testify in court as paid expert witnesses. And they often say they can tell. But Dr. Sisi ran a test where he showed them tapes of kids. Some of them were lying, some were not. And the experts would say, oh, I can tell. But what they said was wrong half the time, in fact, more than half the time, so they did worse than chance. Clearly, there are real cases of sexual abuse of children. We have to address that. Yes, and, and Dr. Sisi won't testify on behalf of the defense because he's afraid he'll let a real molester off because of this. But it's important not to influence the children, and Sisi says to test an alternative hypothesis. In other words, to ask the child, well, Joe did this to you, and then what did Jane do to you? The child starts talking about more people, and at least you have a reason to be suspicious. Thank you, John. Well, next, for more than 11 years, she was one of the most powerful women. Okay, any reactions? Any thoughts about what you saw? Did you see the sandstone? That was stereotyping, right? The kid said he ripped the book and he soiled the teddy bear. He was throwing stuff in the air. Really, really fast. But what's the reason that they come up with these stories? That to satisfy the interviewer? Well, look, in part, I mean, the lesson is that the stories are motivated by the pre-interview induction or the stereotyping or the repeated statement to the child, statements to all the children that a, a clumsy guy's coming. Um, but the... You know, all of this research is subject to being attacked. Like I said, when I was out in Minnesota, there's this new research about the, the impact of anatomical diagrams in the Finding Words Corner House interview. But, you know, you've got to take a look at the research and say to yourself, well, does it make sense? Does it reflect what happens in real life? And a couple of the things they did here, that they did here was, they presented the kids with fictitious evidence. They showed them a ripped book, and they showed them a teddy bear that had stains on it. And they said, I wonder who did this. I wonder if that Sam Stone did this. Now, C.C. and Brock and the folks who did some of this research might suggest that, well, that's what you investigators do. Well, I'm not so sure people did that even in the late 80s, early 90s, but we don't do that kind of thing anymore. We don't ask kids to speculate. And we certainly never presented them with false evidence. We didn't take out a soiled teddy bear and ask kids to speculate. It's a good lesson. You don't want to ask kids to speculate. The other thing that may have been at work here, one of the questions was this. You know, we have this teddy bear that's dirty, and we have these torn up books. I wonder if Sam Stone was wearing long pants or short pants when he did this. And the kids answered the question. They said, 
He's wearing long pants. So is the kid asking the is the child answering the question of who did it, or simply telling us the kind of pants Sandstone had on that day? So some of the conclusions are a little bit distorted in the sense that the children may have interpreted that question as saying, well, we know who did this. We're the grown-ups. We investigated this already. We need your help on what kind of pants he was wearing because you were there that day. So the kid is really answering what he was wearing and not so much that he did it. Nevertheless, some kids have false memories. What I like to do when look at, looking at these studies is, fo is focus on the positives. These are the most extreme examples they're showing us. Most of the kids didn't say that Sam Stone did it and they witnessed it. Very few of them claim to have witnessed it. And if the brightest forensic interview researchers in the world developed a research model that's designed to f make kids fail, isn't it good news that most of them didn't fail? And we can look at the kids who messed up, and we do, and it's startling, and it's troubling, to say the least. But isn't it a testament to the resiliency of kids in resisting suggestion that in some cases three quarters of them wouldn't bite, that they wouldn't agree? And these kids, especially the mousetrap one, that's the one that looked at a lot of things, including diet imagery. Those kids were told in the beginning to think about getting your finger caught in the mousetrap. What would it be like? What would it feel like if you got your finger caught in the mousetrap? So in those cases, kids were told that week after week after week. I think Billy, who had the false recollection with the finger and his brother Colin and all that, they were interviewed for 14 weeks. And the first few weeks, they were inoculated with misinformation and told to speculate over and over again. Now, CC might say, that's, he said, this is a pale comparison to what happens in real cases. Wow. I disagree. And it certainly isn't the way forensic investigations are conducted now. You know, and the research is important. It causes us to reflect. It causes us to identify things that can undermine the integrity of the process. It causes us to avoid certain things. So we know, don't ask repetitive questions. Don't stereotype the perpetrator. Don't ask kids to speculate or imagine. So there are good lessons here. But I'm not so sure that these projects, these research projects, are completely analogous to what really happens in child abuse investigations. And one of the most dissimilar aspects that's pointed out by Professor Lyon in your article, The New Wave in Children's Suggestibility, from 1999. The children in our cases have no connection. I mean, the children in our cases typically have a significant connection to the person they're being questioned about. In fact, they, in almost all cases, have a disincentive to tell us what happened. These children we're interviewing don't want to tell that their grandfather or their uncle or their father or their mother did things to them. They are in a position where they're going to be a lot less likely to fall prey to suggestive questioning than a kid who's asked about some unknown dude named Sam Stone. Sam Stone. It's easy to throw Sam Stone under the bus, is what I'm saying. Who cares about Sam Stone? I don't know. He's not my daddy. He's just some guy. So... Research like this is measured by how authentic it is, how close it is to what really happens. 
So while it can be instructive, at the end of the day, it doesn't mean that kids are falsely accusing people left and right because we do bad interviews. Uh, first of all, we're, we don't do interviews like they say we do, especially now. And the children that we interview are in a quite different posture than those kids were. Um, they have a strong disincentive to inform on their parents and loved ones. And that's what child maltreatment investigations are all about. Kids who are being asked to inform on people they love and trust and care about. So the dynamics are, are quite different. But again, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't pay attention to what we're learning here. This is good stuff. It's it just, you can't make the jump because this happened that people are falsely accusing their parents. You can't make that leap, that's what I'm saying. It's helpful, but it doesn't have what's called in research ecological validity. And ecological validity simply means how similar is the research experiment to what happens in real life. The more similar, the better and more valid and more meaningful the research. The less similar, the less valid. And one thing we know for sure, you cannot molest kids and then study how they tell. So you're never going to have pure ecological validity. The anatomical dolls, we don't use dolls that look like that anymore. And I'll teach you about anatomical dolls later in this course, but you don't use the dolls unless a child discloses or says something. And the dolls are used to help the child demonstrate with more detail what happened. These children were simply given the dolls and told to interact with them. And then they drew conclusions about what they said, and then they asked them highly leading, highly suggestive, and at times misleading questions. That's not the protocol we use for dolls. The dolls don't even look like that anymore. The dolls are um, less scary, less odd looking. And, you know, they... Mr. Um, Souza, the grandfather who was accused in Lowell, Massachusetts, says, and at one point, they accused me of putting my whole head in my daughter's vagina. Do you think there would be evidence? Do you think somebody would have heard or saw something or be some damage to that child? Well, one of the things we learn here, and you may have read already in your readings, real little kids, especially preschoolers, can sometimes express themselves metaphorically with how it felt. So, a finger or an object in the vagina or the anus becomes, he put a stick inside me. Because that's what it felt like. And that's a cousin of what we already study, auditory discrimination error. Where a child who is penetrated from behind has never experienced that. So they express it in a way that makes sense to them that he put a stick in there, in my butt. They don't know about penises and dildos and object penetrations. So they approximate something that's relevant to their world in expressing what happened to them. Now look, at the end of the day, we're going to put people in jail? No, we need more evidence. But my point is, don't simply dismiss the child as unworthy of belief because they make a statement like that and there's no stick to be found. Because little kids approximate and they speak metaphorically. And why don't you guys tell me what the child may have been describing when the Grandpa Sousa dismissively says, Wow, the kid accused me of putting my whole head in her vagina. It's, it's preposterous. It never happens. In, it never happens. What might the child been expressing?
put his head in my vagina, that may be the child saying he performed cutilagus on it. That's her way of saying it. Yet he's so incredulous at the suggestion that they should throw this case out immediately. Well, I don't know the facts of that case. Um, I, I, I've seen it this many, many times. This clip. Did she say that he, they put her in a cage or something? Or? Yeah, yeah. There's a cage in his stomach. Yeah, you know, I, that I don't know. I, I, without knowing more about the case and the context of the child's statement, I wouldn't be able to. But Maybe it is. I'm not saying they weren't falsely accused. I don't know. I don't know how bad the interviewing was. But, you know, Maybe there was a little cave dog pen down there or something. And, you know, that was, it was big. It was as big as this house. You know, you can see a kid overstating things. Again, I'm not saying people should go to jail because little kids make incredulous statements. But there might be, there might be another reason why, another way of interpreting what they say. And sometimes with corroboration and other evidence, you might have a case. And we simply shouldn't stop investigating was a kid made a what appears to be a wacky statement like that. You need to keep moving along. There may be developmentally important reasons why they express themselves in that way. And all the kids who failed miserably in these experiments were the third and fourth graders. They're easy pickings. They're hard to prosecute those cases. We're very rarely to prosecute those cases. Child protection very rarely validates those cases. Any other observations? Okay, there's a discussion board that I subscribe to in your discussion forums. Do you have any questions during the week about the exam or a subject that we touched upon? Put it in there and maybe your fellow students will have an answer or maybe I'll chime in. Uh, but there's an exam review discussion board. Okay, and I'll see you guys next week.